So my name is Donald Clark. I, I'm from Scotland, although I live in England, and I've spent all my adult life in learning technologies uh, from the very early days before the internet. Uh, but really, the last 10 years or so, I've been wholly focused on AI or artificial intelligence for learning. I've written four books in learning theory, artificial intelligence, uh, the metaverse, and also learning technologies in general. Uh, you know, I've started and built companies in this area, sold them in the stock market. I've been an investor in this area and been involved in teaching in higher education. So all angles, but all about learning technology. That's all my adult life. People have been using artificial intelligence, Google's artificial intelligence, uh, all your interface design and social media, your timelines are mediated by artificial intelligence, Netflix is artificial intelligence, it's everywhere. It protects your bank accounts, it stops stuff coming into spam in your email, but it's invisible. The big breakthrough was in November uh, 2022 with generative AI, what we know as chat GPT, and that is something quite unique because for the first time in the history of our species, you have something that seems like another person. It's so powerful, it sort of blows your mind when you start using it. And this is a real break point because that's getting much better very quickly. So chat GPT-4, which was in March, suddenly was much better than three. I mean, really much better. And we're now getting versions of the software or artificial intelligence, generative AI, that is allowing you to teach using the thing. But the real application of this is really with ordinary people on their smartphones, in their job, helping, it, helping them to do stuff. So almost everybody's got a story about how it helped them write a report, create an email, write a card, help them teach. You know, even people who have practical jobs are using it in the field to look up standards and buildings. So you're seeing it pop up everywhere for learning. So I think it's like an emergent thing and I think that is one of the most important areas, but it has its limitations. Other areas of uh, artificial intelligence will come in and be bolted onto the side of that because it doesn't help you. It doesn't have a context. It doesn't have a world view. You know, it doesn't have senses and you'll need that as well. So I think you'll see it becoming more like us, smarter, knowing the context. And then eventually we, it will be an avatar as a teacher, like a universal teacher that will know everything it will be able to teach in any subject, 24 hours a day. It will be endlessly friendly and benevolent. Uh, and it will all have all that beautiful, good teaching practice built into it. So that is the vision, I think. This is where we're heading. A universal teacher or a universal doctor, a doctor that's better than any human doctor, can read your symptoms, take your tests, interpret them, make a diagnosis, recommend a treatment. I think we're heading on that path as well. But my area of interest is this notion of a universal teacher. How far can we push that? And I think we're getting there very quickly, much faster than we thought we would. Well, I think for a long time, certainly, because uh, it will be a teaching assistant for many years before it gets to universal teaching. But teachers now really have to start upskilling to learn to use this technology because you can work with it. So it's not that your job will be replaced by AI or ChatGPT, but your job will be replaced by somebody who is using it. So the teachers who know how to use this blend into the AI world will be the better teachers. Uh, but the, the truth is this is an issue because there are jobs will be lost. But this is true of any technology. As soon as you get, you know, we no longer have horses and horse drivers, <laughs> but we have motor cars, you know, this, but people switch over. The mistake is to think that it's a fixed, but this is an old Marxist idea, that there's a fixed job of employment. It's a fixed number of jobs. This is just not true. New jobs get created all the time. So in IT, for example, you have the internet came along. Millions of jobs have been created just from writing code, the internet. They were new jobs, they didn't exist before. So this idea that the number of jobs is in a fixed quantity in a fixed box is an old Marxist idea that turns out to be false. So the new jobs will be created, some of the old ones, but most people will be in the middle. Their jobs will change rather than them not having a job. This stuff's different. This is a different revolution because it can replace a teacher. 
it can replace a manager because it's doing things that human beings used to do. Other technologies have always been adjuncts or add-ons to human beings. This one is actually going right to the core of because it has cognitive skills. And many people, middle class people especially in management jobs, thought that their jobs would be irreplaceable. Actually, the jobs that are irreplaceable, the area AI has not worked in has been the jo working class jobs, physical jobs, jobs of the heart and the hand. So people who have jobs to do with the head or cognition, AI is threatening that far more than people who work with their hands or their heart. You know, the, the, the nurses, the people who have to have empathy and sympathy with patients in hospitals, uh, the peop your plumbers, your delivery drivers, all those people aren't losing their jobs. We need more of them. Actually, what we mean, may need less of are people with these so-called 21st century or critical skills, because much of that can possibly be replaced by the cognitive skills that are emerging within AI. <laughs>I personally think this is not about changing the skills in the university system. I think it's about rebalancing the system so that we have a fairer, more balanced vocational practical learning landscape as well. Because the big shortages are in nurses or drivers and, you know, physical jobs. That's where all the skill shortages are across Europe as we, and America as we speak. It's not a shortage of cognitive skills in graduates. We have plenty of those. Uh, we're having trouble recruiting people into jobs where things have to get done in the physical real world. So most education deals just with text. Well, actually, you don't deal with text all the time in the real world. Hardly anybody here is... Have, have you written anything today? Not really. This whole conference, you're organising it, it's not a text-based conference. It's 3D people in a 3D space listening to 3D presenters. We don't have enough of the 3D stuff, but that's coming. The biggest cause for me to reflect in education was the birth of my sons. So I had twin boys who were real trouble, by the way. <laughs> when they were, like I was trouble when I was 16. They were much bigger trouble if you have two at the same time, same age. Now, one is quite academic. You learn very quickly if you have children that you're not going to change their personality because 50% of it is genetic, so they're going to be what they're going to be. These two kids, you wouldn't know they were, two kids, you wouldn't know they were brothers. One goes off, does a degree in maths and artificial intelligence, very sort of, you know, good at that. The other hates school, very social, really good social skills, goes into marketing, runs a mar tech, tech marketing company. And I learned a lot from those kids about relaxing, about imposing your views on them because they'll be what they're going to be. Secondly, they had completely different ways of seeing life and learning. So the kid who was the AI guy, he's also really super good at sports. So he got in the England team on Taekwondo. In fact, he was fighting this week. He's in the World Championships in September. And I learned a lot from him because teaching a sport is really different. And I used to go along to competitions and watch the coaches and I learned a lot from watching how people teach sport because it's all about competence. When he goes into the ring and fights with some giant Russian or Polish guy, you know, it's frightening, it's brave, but you have to be super skilled. And how do you get people really super skilled? Practice, practice, practice. I learned from him that practice is the key to real successful learning. Now the learning literature shows that this is true. Deliberate practice, space practice, there's a hundred different forms of practice, but good guided coach practice is what education doesn't do. It gives you lectures, write an essay, it's events. Learning is a process, not an event. And you don't get anywhere in sport by seeing it as an event. Who learns a sport from being lectured to or write an essay? Yeah, of course. What you learn is massive amounts of practice, slight adjustments all the way towards competence. I learned that from uh, that son. The other son I learned social skills from. So I'm, I'm an extended story here. So he's really verbally very good, funny, you know, relaxed. Uh, you know, everybody likes him because he's verbally very strong. But that's why university would have been a disaster for him. Sit writing essays. 
So he couldn't wait to get out into the real world, speak to people, start selling, building a business, doing the marketing. He loves that. Threw himself right into it and has been very successful there. So, birth of my two kids. That was the, that was the big moment for me, especially twins, because it's like having a genetic experiment. <laughs> you know, you, you're the parent, you, see, you have this experiment. Well, they were, they were both born the same day, treated the same way, but they're so completely different. And that's what we have to cope with, difference. We want everybody to be the same. Oh, everybody should go to university, everybody should get a degree, everybody should be good at writing essays. Really? I don't think so. Why would everybody aspire to do that? Uh, you know, there are many people who don't aspire to do that. They want to do something in the real world. You know, they don't want to be theorists. Learning and education in a wider sense, globally. I'm not talking about the European model or North American model, because they've got, they'll be okay. They've got plenty of money. Those are advanced economies. Where this technology, the AI technology, comes in for me is helping everybody else, the people who are further away from education than they've ever been before because of the stretching out of inequalities. I think the huge benefits are its capability to teach in any language, hundreds of languages, in any subject, at any time, to any person, no matter what they're... If you've got dyslexia, it'll help you. If you've, got, if you've got autism, it will cope with your autism. It will be massively personalised for every individual, globally. So the benefits are massive here. And here you get... I've been very challenging here in both my keynote and the workshop and the, the session we had. I've been quite challenging with people about the model here. But the good news is people are coming up to me and they're pleased to be challenged. Because that's what these conferences should be about. Why would you pay to come to a conference where you're just going to hear things that you agree with? That makes no sense to me whatsoever. Some people would like that, actually, and they get very upset if they hear something different. But actually, these people are pretty smart. They're all teaching higher. They understand that we're here to think or be exposed to new ideas. So hopefully, I've managed to do some of that, you know, this conference. I mean, you've, you guys have been kind enough to invite me. That's a brave decision because I'm quite challenging, I think, you know. And also, uh, Ashok, who was the speaker before me, I am a huge admirer of him, and he does very similar to things. We're both heading in the same direction. And it was the first time I met him, so I'm so pleased for that because uh, he's a bit of a hero of mine because he's been implementing this stuff for real. It's been all, so far, it's been a fantastic experience for me because of the variety of the people, their willingness to be challenged, and meeting Ashok as well. So it's all good. And this is a fantastic place. I've never been to Palma. I walked into town last night, it exceeded my expectations. I can't tell you how much because uh, coming from England, you have a very weird view of some Spanish places. You know, Mallorca is like a beach destination, but it was so nice to see old school Spain, beautiful restaurants. It's a beautiful city here. So I look forward to seeing more of that. <laughs>